Hello everyone and welcome to our week four talk. Today we are hosting Dr. Jim Spencer who will be talking about the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Jim did his PhD at the University of Bristol with the late Tony Clark and then worked as a postdoc with Vladek Miner at the University of Virginia and at the UK Institute of National Research with Steve Gamblin. He is a reader of microbiology at the University of Bristol and is working on several aspects of the antimicrobial resistance problem, including studying tuberculosis and the mechanism of beta-lactamase enzymes. If you have any questions for Jim during the talk, please put them in the comments section and I will read them out for you. Jim, I am so glad that you have joined us today. I will now hand over to you and your exciting presentation. Um, thank you very much, Anka. Um, I hope everybody can see and hear me. Um, I'm really honoured to be invited. I, I confess that I hadn't realised the um, distinguished history of the Oxford University Scientific Society until I looked you up on the web recently. And so it really is a great privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to try in the next 40 or so minutes to give an overview of a really huge subject. Um, and by ne necessity, really, um, it's got to be selective and biased very much by my own areas of interest. Um, but I'm going to attempt to do the following things. So um, I'll start by making a few comments about the development of antibiotics uh, with a little bit of historical perspective. Um, I'll say something about how resistance has emerged and make some comments on where I see the major problems of antimicrobial resistance being at the moment. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the possible routes by which resistance might be overcome. And in the last part of the talk, I'll get a little bit closer to um, some of my own research. Um, so I'm going to talk about resistance to beta-lactams, that's the penicillin type antibiotics and their relatives, um, mediated by degradative enzymes, those are beta-lactamases, and that to some extent illustrates what, if you like, is an arms race in antimicrobial resistance between bacterial evolution on the one hand and human ingenuity, particularly medicinal chemistry, on the other. And I'll wrap up with a, a few concluding comments at the end. So the, the idea that it would be possible to identify an agent with selective toxicity against microbial pathogens, but with little or no effect on the human host, is one that goes back something more than a century. Um, and in a sense, the forerunner was um, Paul Ehrlich, shown here, um, who termed the concept of what he called a magic bullet. And this was inspired by discoveries at the end of the 19th century that um, using dyes, it was possibly to selectively label bacterial cells over um, eukaryotic equivalents. So Ehrlich reasoned that it might be possible to extend that concept and um, instead identify agents with selective toxicity. And he did really a very um, contemporary experiment, which was then to screen a chemical library um, in collaboration with his um, colleague, um, Sahajiro Hata, um, looking for molecules with selective toxicity against a number of the um, leading microbial pathogens of the day. Um, and the most famous discovery was of the, the agent Salvasan, which is an arsenic-based compound, which was demonstrated to have toxicity against um, Treponema pallidum, the cause of syphilis. And this discovery really transformed the, the outlook for patients with syphilis, which was um, endemic in, in much of the world at the time. So all of this took place um, immediately preceding the First World War. Um, and that discovery was an inspiration to a number of scientists who came after. And the, the most famous of these is probably Alexander Fleming. Um, Fleming's discovery of penicillin is well known, um, not quite so well known as the work in Oxford by um, Flory Chain and Norman Heatley, who were able to take Fleming's identification of an antimicrobial substance, penicillin, produced by penicillium mold, and um, extract sufficient uh, penicillin to, to make it useful to treat infections in human patients. So the identification of penicillin, uh, which took place in the early 1940s, really paved the way for what we now talk about as 
a golden age of antimicrobial discovery. Excuse me. Um, what I mean by that is that in the two decades following the discovery of penicillin, um, many researchers in several different countries took the decision to look for substances with similar antimicrobial activity, particularly, but not exclusively, in natural products. And this really yielded a rich variety of antimicrobial substances and actually identified and brought to clinic most of the antimicrobials that we still rely upon today. So what this meant is that in the years immediately following World War II, there was great optimism that um, this rich vein of, of anti antibiotics that had been successfully exploited meant that um, really we could start thinking about the prospect of overcoming infectious diseases. Um, from where we are today, that, that's, um, that's obviously something that hasn't come to pass. But I think it's worth pointing out that Fleming himself realised that um, Antibiotics such as penicillin weren't necessarily the, the panacea that they might have been thought. Um, in his Nobel Prize lecture in 1945, when he shared the Nobel Prize with Florian Chain, he made the following statement, which is worth repeating. So he said, it's not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them. And the same thing has occasionally happened in the body. What he then said was that the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. And there is the danger that the, the, the ignorant individual could underdose themselves, expose their microbial flora to a sublethal dose, and in that way, elicit resistance. And as he, as he states, he, he wasn't speculating here. Um, he was aware that um, resistance had already been identified in the laboratory, um, indeed, um, an enzyme that degraded penicillin had already been identified by Abraham and Chain working in Oxford before any human being had ever been been dosed with the with the drug. So it was it was clear already to Fleming that antimicrobial resistance was a prospect that might limit the efficacy of drugs like penicillin. So. Indeed, what we've seen since that time for all drugs that have been brought to clinic is ultimately the emergence of resistance. So as I've already said, penicillin resistance was identified even before penicillin had been administered to a human patient. Sometimes resistance emerges that quickly. In other cases, it can take decades. So. Um, Lycopeptides like vancomycin, key drugs for treating methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Resistance to lycopeptides was not detected until the mid-1980s, more than three decades after these drugs were first brought, brought to clinic. So the emergence of resistance happens on a very variable time scale, but so far it has always happened. And that's true whether antibiotics have been based upon natural products or whether they are entirely synthetic molecules with no equivalent in nature. So bringing this up to date, in the last few years, antimicrobial resistance has now been recognized as a global public health threat. In large part, that's been down to the work of Professor Dame Sally Davis, um, the former chief medical officer of the UK, um, who really worked tirelessly to raise awareness of antimicrobial resistance um, at both um, UK and international levels. Um, that motivated the UK government to um, commission the economist Jim O'Neill, um, who's perhaps better known for um, terming the phrase of the, the, the brick economies, um, to work with, a, um, to, to produce a report to identify the scale of the problem of antimicrobial resistance and attempt to identify some potential solutions that could be implemented. So O'Neill came up with some fairly alarming predictions, and these are a couple of um, images taken from his report. The first concerned the, the likely impact of antimicrobial resistance. His estimate was that at present, in the time of writing is 2016, there are around 700,000 
deaths per year globally that could be attributed to antimicrobial resistance. And that's likely to be a low estimate. If nothing was done, O'Neill projected that by 2050, that number of deaths would rise to 10 million. So outstripping, for instance, the current level of cancer deaths of over 8 million per year. The economic consequences would also be extraordinary. Um, he projected a total loss of global gross domestic product of over $100 trillion by 2050 if interventions were not put in place. And of course, this would, this would be transformative for modern healthcare. So um, procedures which are now almost routine, like joint replacements, for example, would become unviable because of the risk of um, untreatable infections, which um, would be associated with those processes. The prophylactic antibiotics, which we use now, and which these procedures rely on, would of course no longer be available. But what O'Neill also projected was that the, the impact of antimicrobial resistance wouldn't be restricted to um, surgical procedures in relatively high resource settings. Indeed, the, the main burden of antimicrobial resistance is projected to fall on low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa and in Asia. And here, where infectious diseases that are potentially treatable, like di diarrheal diseases or um, respiratory in infections, pneumonias, um, the prospect of these being untreatable by any available drugs, obviously, is, is, is one that raises considerable alarm. So, Based on the work of O'Neill and many others, um, organizations like the um, Centers for Disease Control in the United States, for example, have identified a number of specific areas of concern around antimicrobial resistance. And I've listed um, a selection of them here. I would divide these roughly into two categories. And the first of these would be organisms responsible for opportunistic, healthcare associated infections of patients typically in secondary care. So organisms that are able to colonize compromised individuals, so perhaps who are recovering from um, major surgery or elderly patients with weakened immune systems. So, so these would be organisms like MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, shown here in this image, um, specific opportunistic bacterial pathogens with resistance to particular drugs. So the, the glycopeptide resistant enterococci that I mentioned a moment ago, various organisms like E. coli and its relatives expressing specific resistance to particular types of beta-lactam antibiotics, more of those later in the talk, and also a range of um, opportunistic environmental organisms that are typically refractory to a wide range of antibiotics and can readily acquire resistance, additional resistance to make them extremely difficult to treat. So there's a variety of resistant organisms which are already causing substantial concern in, in healthcare settings. But what's also important is the emergence of resistance in the community. And while organisms like E. coli, for example, which um, is the most common cause of urinary tract infections in the community, are also associated with community acquired resistance, um, the threat extends to other pathogens such as Neisseria gonorrhea, shown here, the cause of the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea, where we're already down to the last couple of anti antibiotics and starting to see strains that are only treatable with um, invasive and in, in um, injectable therapies. And then looming over all of this is the prospect of drug resistant tuberculosis. And I think it's worth di um, digressing just for a moment to um, say something about the, the tuberculosis situation. And this is a slide from the World Health Organization. Um, well, I, um, I, I teach a little bit about tuberculosis and um, the statistics associated with TB always give me pause. As you may be aware, TB is one of the three main infectious killers in, 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 in the world today, the other two being HIV and malaria. Um, 
very roughly one quarter of the world's population is infected with TB. Most of those individuals have, la have latent tuberculosis and won't know that they have it. But every year, there are around 10 million new cases of TB disease identified and around 1.3 million deaths. Now, for the last couple of decades, TB has been associated with the ongoing HIV pandemic, but increasingly we're seeing a growth in multi-resistant strains of the, orga the causative organism. So multiple, resist multiple drug resistant or MDR TB is described as being resistant to the, the two major tuberculosis drugs, rivampicin and isoniazid. Towards 600,000 of these 10 million new infections are now associated with multi-resistance. The proportion of deaths due to multiple resistant, not multi-resistant TB is, as you might expect, considerably higher. And in large part, um, multi-resistance TB is now clear, is associated with individuals who have previously been treated for TB disease and for whatever reason, non-compliance, poor access to, to, to medicines um, may not have entirely resolved the disease. And of course, that would come as no surprise to, um, to Fleming speaking decades ago. So before I talk about why we've got to this point, I I think it's worth saying that um, it's important to realize that antimicrobial resistance is not a new thing. We've had access to antibiotics for a, lit a little over a hundred years, if you if you count salvasone. Um, but evidence is clear that antimicrobial resistance is out there in the micro in the royal microbial world in the environment, and has been there for an extremely long time. This slide um, shows um, a river in Alaska, a relatively pristine environment. And, and what I'm referring to here is, is work done by um, a woman called Jo Handelsman, um, who um, in later years went on to be a scientific advisor to the Barack Obama White House. And she was one of a, her, hers was one of a number of groups that looked in pristine environments with very little human contamination and no microbial exposure to um, uh, synthetic antibiotics and looked for the presence of antimicrobial resistance genes. So she sampled soils from an island on a, a, a river in remote central Alaska and was able to identify multiple beta-lactamase enzymes, so enzymes that degrade and confer resistance to, to penicillin and its relatives in various organisms from these pristine environments. And moreover, in the lab, she was able to show that these genes could be transferred from these environmental species into human relevant pathogens such as E. coli. So it's very clear as we are better able to understand the microbial environment that resistance has been around for a long time and there is an environmental pool of resistance genes which long predates our use of antibiotics and has the potential to be mobilized into human pathogens. So I wanted to talk now about some of the reasons why the problem of antimicrobial resistance has, is, now, is now considered to be a, a global public health threat. Um, and there are multiple reasons for, for the, the, the current situation. I don't have time to, to, to talk in detail about all of them, but um, I will touch on some of them. And the first point I want to make is connected with the idea that many antimicrobial resistant infections are associated with the population of susceptible individuals, immunocompromised patients. So these might be people recovering from um, invasive surgery. They might be individuals with an underlying condition, for example, HIV, that renders them susceptible to opportunistic infections. Um, they equally might be taking aggressive um, therapies with immunosuppressive effects, perhaps to prevent rejection of transplants or in the case of individuals with cancers, side effects of, of chemotherapy regimes. And this slide sh simply shows the increasing incidence of cancer registrations in the UK over the last few decades. This, of course, is associated with, with lots of factors. Our 
ability to recognize disease more readily, our aging population, and most cancers are diseases of the elderly. But it's clear that the, the population of susceptible patients is growing. We've also clearly been unwise on occasions in our use of antibiotics. This is a somewhat contentious subject. Um, so certainly in the UK, um, I think many vets would feel that um, veterinary and agricultural use of antibiotics has been somewhat unfairly um, labelled as the, the source of all our troubles. Um, but nevertheless, it is pretty clear that in, uh, um, in some circumstances, intensive agriculture um, has and some in some places still continues to rely upon the use of antibiotics. And that's both to enable high stocking densities um, while suppressing the infections that would otherwise be associated with those. And also to, to promote growth, to, to ensure that more of the, the animal's food intake is converted into um, growing its own tissue rather than its um, associated bacteria. But our use of antibiotics has also been questionable in human medicine. This is the data from the O'Neill report. Um, they looked at respiratory infections in the US and estimated that um, of the 40 million annual prescriptions for antibiotics, over half of those, 27 million, were probably unnecessary. So for instance, patients whose respiratory infection had a viral rather than bacterial origin. So it's been clear for multiple reasons that antibiotics have often been prescribed for to human patients where they, they are not necessary and may on occasions even be detrimental. So the, the human factor is, is one issue um, that has influ influenced the, the current resistance situation. But we also need to consider that with antibiotics, we're effectively trying to hit a moving target because um, bacteria are evolving in response to the selection pressure that we're imposing. If we think about it in, in the lab, something like E. coli will undergo a round of division in a little over half an hour. So even a relatively short time in human terms can support many generations of bacterial replication um, and selection for mutations that affect susceptibility to antibiotics. So typically a patient with a population, oops, a patient with a population of bacteria under antibiotic selection pressure, the antibiotics will kill off a large proportion of that population, perhaps leaving some surviving um, variants or mutants with reduced susceptibility. And those will multiply even in the presence of antibiotic selection can potentially be passed on to other individuals, giving them an infection which is no longer treatable. So this selection for pre-existing resistant strains or mutants is, is one way by which resistance can emerge. But bacteria can also exchange resistance genes within a population. Bacteria don't have sex, but they are promiscuous. They can readily, by a number of mechanisms, exchange genetic material with other bacteria in the close environment, even when those other bacteria are of different species. In particular, I want to draw your attention to these small circular pieces of DNA separate from the main bacterial chromosome that can readily be passed from bacterial cell to bacterial cell and frequently contain genes that are responsible for antibiotic resistance. So this movement of antibiotic resistance genes on plasmids horizontally within a bacterial population can rapidly give rise to a large population of resistant organisms. So on top of this, we have also seen a severe diminution in the rate of antibiotic discovery since the golden age of the 1950s and early 1960s. With one exception not shown on this slide, and that's a, a drug specifically used to treat TB, there have been no new classes of antibiotics discovered since the mid 1980s. That's not to say that new agents have not been developed, but those new agents have been iterations of existing drug classes 
we failed to find new drugs with novel modes of action which are not going to be susceptible to known resistance mechanisms. There are several reasons for this. Antibiotic discovery is scientifically challenging. It's not easy to find a drug selective for a single organism, far harder to find a drug which will work against multiple bacteria, multiple bacterial targets, is safe to use in human patients, and, and retains effectiveness against targets that will differ slightly between organisms. There are also issues around development costs. So an antibiotic could be given for multiple indications, for respiratory infections, for urinary tract infections, for um, skin and skin structure infections, for example. Each of these requires a separate, expensive clinical trial to demonstrate safety and efficacy. And of course, antibiotic profitability is low because the patient will take an antibiotic therapy for a relatively short duration, maybe a couple of weeks, and the infection will either resolve or they will be transferred to a different therapy. And of course, that contrasts very unfavorably with um, drugs for chronic conditions like um, um, heart conditions or, or perhaps um, depressive illnesses, where, which a patient will take for months or even years on end. Those then are some thoughts about um, why we are in our current situation. Um, what can we do in the way of possible interventions? The O'Neill report makes 10 separate recommendations about how one might counter bacterial, bacterial infections and the antibiotic resistance crisis. I'm just gonna talk about, about four of those. The first of these is to be smarter about our use of antibiotics. Resistance can come at a cost for bacteria in the sense that the mutations that um, or modifications that confer antibiotic resistance may make the organism less fit compared to its antibiotic susceptible brethren. So what that means is that if antibiotic selection is removed, there is the chance that the resistant strain will be outcompeted by the susceptible fitter strains with which it's competing in, in its native environment. This is one example of where this appears to be the case. So what this slide shows is data from a survey of resistance um, in E. coli to the antibiotic colistin in farmed pigs in China. The backstory here is that colistin is a drug that is um, used as a last resort agent in human medicine to treat infections by organisms resistant to other types of treatment. It is quite toxic, so it's, it's not widely used, but it has a unique and important place in the antibiotic arsenal. Unfortunately, it's also been widely used in intensive agriculture. So it was perhaps no surprise that in 2015, a plasmid mediated resistance gene was identified in an E. coli strain that came from a pig and subsequently was identified in, in E. coli from human patients. So this work caused the Chinese government to take action. And in early 2017, they banned colistin use in agriculture. And so what this slide shows is data reporting the prevalence of colistin resistance in E. coli before and after the ban took effect. Don't worry about the colors, they refer to different genetic supports for colistin resistance. The message is simply that the incidence of colistin resistance decreased markedly once colistin selection pressure was withdrawn. Now, similar um, experiments have been, or um, programs have been conducted on antibiotics used in human medicine. This doesn't work for all antibiotics and, and, and um, in all situations, but in certain, certain circumstances, regulating antibiotic use can be effective. So one problem with um, regulating the, the use of antibiotics is that as we've seen previously, um, it demands that the, the prescriber knows something about when it's appropriate to give an antibiotic. In the case of GPs, for example, 
It's not always apparent when a patient presenting with symptoms will be suffering from a bacterial or viral condition, as we saw in the, the, um, the example of respiratory infections in the US. In a large number of cases, um, prescribe, prescribers give antibiotics when the underlying cause of the disease is viral. But they don't know that, and they're, they're, they're essentially working blind. Similarly, in secondary care, a patient with a severe infection, sus suspected sepsis, for example, they need antibiotics fast or their outcome will, will, will sufficiently and will significantly deteriorate. So in those circumstances, the prescriber needs to give an empiric therapy, a broad spectrum agent, um, without knowing what pathogen they're dealing with and what its profile of susceptibility to drugs is. So if prescribers have access to diagnostic information, which would quickly give them an identification of the pathogen present and ideally its drug susceptibility, that would enable us to use drugs only when necessary and use the right drug for the right infection. There are multiple efforts to try and improve diagnostics to make this possible. This is one example of work I, I was involved in. Um, this is very much laboratory rather than clinical, clinical, clinic, clinically based. But what we're trying to do here is detect modifications to the RNA component of the bacterial ribosome, the addition of these methyl groups that are associated with resistance to specific antibiotics. What we've done is use um, specific probes attached to colored dyes that will bind to the target sequence on the ribosome in the absence, but not the presence of the modification associated with resistance. And by imaging these organisms in the presence of combinations of the different probes, merging the resulting data, we can get a picture at an individual cellular level of which of these organisms is containing modifications associated with a resistance phenotype. And while access to the, 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 the sophisticated microscopy um, infrastructure isn't going to be possible, in a clinical lab, it at least shows that um, the principle that detecting resistance rapidly is something that can be can be possible. And I think in the next few years, this will transform antibiotic prescribing. So another important factor is clearly to fix the antibiotic pipeline, which in many respects can be considered to be broken. O'Neill, as an economist, says a lot about this in his report, but essentially we can divide these interventions into two, um, what might be termed push incentives, which are designed to increase funding um, from government or charitable agencies in particular to incentivize early stage antibiotic development, along with pull policies, which are designed to reward perhaps commercial entities when an antibiotic reaches market. And that's really important because the link between sales and perceived success at the moment is extremely detrimental to investments in antibiotic research. At the moment, new drugs, if they are successfully developed, they're reserved for severe infections to, um, to prevent the emergence of resistance, which means that sales are likely to be low. Um, so in the last 12 months, there have been two bankruptcies um, of um, SMEs who have successfully brought new antibiotics to market. Most big pharma have disengaged from the area for precisely this reason. So a sea change is now recognized as being required in making the market sustainable to reward antibiotic development. And lastly, it's clear that we need to think about exploring alternative therapies and approaches to use alongside traditional small molecule antibiotics. So this would include things like um, developing vaccines for conditions that were previously um, treated with antibiotics. So things like uh, pneumococcal disease in the UK would be an example of that, along with implementing alternative therapies like bacteriophages and their constituent um, toxins. So viruses that are selective for bacterial pathogens without damaging the human host along with things like antibody and immune modulatory therapy to, to help the patient overcome the infection without resort to chemotherapy. And 
So in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm going to turn now to talk about something closer to my own research, and that's the, the ongoing resistance arms race um, between bacteria and medicinal chemists associated with resistance to beta-lactams, that's penicillin and its relatives. The starting point for this was um, also work done in Oxford. This slide shows a model of the structure of penicillin determined by Dorothy Hodgkin. I want to draw your attention to this four-membered ring in the center of the molecule, which is the part of the penicillin molecule that is responsible for its antimicrobial activity. So that's shown here in this stick diagram. When penicillin was first produced on a large scale, it was extremely effective. Um, doses of penicillin were available to um, battlefield casualties in the uh, closing, closing stages of World War II and saved thousands of lives for the people who would otherwise succumb to infection. And initially, their, their use in the civilian setting was similarly successful, but in less than a decade after penicillin introduction to, to general use, um, one of its major target organisms, Staphylococcus aureus, was in large, um, in large um, scale resistant to penicillin treatment. Most of the staphylococcal strains in hospitals in places like the UK could not be treated with penicillin. And the reason was the expression of this molecule here. This is a beta-lactamase, an enzyme that confers resistance to penicillin by degrading the four-membered ring, yielding a ring-open product with no antimicrobial activity. The solution to this resistance was to modify the penicillin scaffold by changing this position here, generating a new drug called methicillin. And methicillin was not susceptible to degradation by the Staphylococcus beta-lactamase and successfully treated those resistant strains. And of course, we now know that Staphylococcus aureus has emerged in its methicillin resistant form. And that's by a different mechanism that I don't want to go into today. What I want to turn my attention to instead is the importance of beta-lactamases to resistance to penicillins and a second type of bacteria, um, E. coli and its relatives. Now, when penicillin was first discovered, it was not effective against E. coli, and it required a second modification, the addition of this amino group here, to enable penicillin to get into the cell and, um, and kill E. coli bacteria. And these amino penicillins successfully extended the, the spectrum of penicillin activity to include many additional bacteria. But of course, as with Staphylococcus aureus, widespread amino penicillin use selected the appearance of beta-lactamases in E. coli that could transfer on these mobile pieces of DNA, plasmids, across multiple bacterial species. Fortunately, and work again in Oxford and identified a new class of beta-lactam antibiotics, the cephalosporins. And although the first cephalosporins to be introduced were also susceptible to E. coli beta-lactamases, modifying the cephalosporin scaffold, this bulky oxyimmuno substituent on its side chain made a drug that the E. coli beta-lactamase could no longer recognize and break down. What in turn took place is an acquisition of modifications of particular positions shown in red on the E. coli beta-lactamase scaffold to generate a so-called extended spectrum enzyme that was resistant to oxyamino cephalosporins or could break these drugs down as well as amino penicillins. And this has led to a reliance on the final class of beta-lactams, the most powerful of these drugs, these are the carbapenems, so they have a different ring next to the beta-lactam ring to penicillins and cephalosporins. They are um, powerful, broad-spectrum drugs effective against many different bacteria um, and oft often used as empiric therapy for most severe types of infections in the healthcare setting. But as we, could ex as we can expect, the selection pressure imposed by carbapenem use has seen the dissemination on a worldwide scale now of beta-lactamases able to break down 
these drugs in addition to other types of beta lactams. And strains of E. coli and related organisms with the ability to degrade carbapenems are now among the, the organisms that are causing most concern in the, in the clinical community. And at this point, we've effectively run out of new classes of beta lactams. So an alternative approach is necessary. And alongside beta lactam development, the other activity in this field has been to identify strategies by which beta lactamase producing bacteria can be countered by a combination of a beta lactam antibiotic and a second drug that specifically inhibits the beta lactamase responsible for resistance. And this slide shows an example of this. What we have here is an agar plate. It's been coated with bacteria. And on top of that has been applied two paper discs, one of which contains keftazidine and one keftazidine together with second agent clobulinate, which is a beta lactamase inhibitor. What we can see is that this clear zone around the disc indicates an area of the plate on which bacteria cannot grow. And with keftazidine alone, this area is pretty small because the presence of the beta lactamase in this organism means that it can tolerate keftazidine up to reasonably high concentrations that escaped from the disc into the surrounding agar. But if we add the beta lactamase or resistance inhibitor, we can see the size of this zone of killing increases because the resistance mechanism has been blocked. Now, clavulinate has been in use for, for um, a few decades, but unfortunately it's not effective against enzymes in particular that degrade carbapenem antibiotics. And much activity in the area, including in um, Professor Schofield's lab in Oxford, has been centered around better beta lactamase inhibitors that effectively combat more different types of beta lactamase. Um, the molecules shown here are all now in clinic or in very late clinical trials, um, and all have sufficiently, have had significantly expanded spectra of activity against a wider range of the beta lactamases that are out there in the clinic. And in particular, this boron-based molecule here, tanibor bactam, effectively inhibits almost all of the beta lactamases that are currently circulating in clinical strains. It's not in the clinic yet, but it promises to be an exciting development for beta lactamase-mediated resistance. Um, and that's where I think I need to conclude. So in summary, um, I told you that while antibiotics have, have transformed medicine over the last century, resistance is not a new thing. It's been around much longer. We have, however, contributed to the current situation by our over or inappropriate use of antibiotics, um, a loss of focus on antibiotic development, um, and that together has exacerbated the resistance problem and means that we are in a situation where we have relatively few effective antibiotics and may lose these in the future. I think we have realised now that a combination of approaches is required to rectify this. And I think by making progress on, on several things, on, on controlling antibiotic use, on making rapid diagnostics widely available to, to enable smart prescribing, as long as developing new drugs and alternative therapies does give some grounds for optimism. But we need to temper that with the idea that the extraordinary ability of bacteria to adapt and change in often surprising ways means that resistance will always be with us. So this is, a, this is a, an issue that we will have to continue to deal with long into the future. And with that, it only remains for me to thank a few people. My um, research group, I haven't really talked about um, their work, but um, it's been a pleasure working with all of them. And um, I, I, of course, rely on their efforts for, for everything that we do. Um, my collaborators, I've only been able to list the PIs, but of course it's their, their respective research groups who, who do the work. And that's collaborators in Bristol, elsewhere in the UK, and in other parts of the world as well. Um, work in my lab has been funded by UK funders, the MRC, UPSRC, and BBSRC, as well as the US National Institute of Health. And with that, um, it just remains for me to thank um, Anchor and the Society again for the invitation and you for your attention, and I'll be pleased to answer questions.
Thank you, Jim, for such a fantastic talk. Uh, it's always great to hear on such a, an interesting topic, especially one that I think needs more exposure uh, in the media and in the public sphere in general. So we've got a few questions uh, coming up. So let me have a look at the first one, if we can bring that up, please. Uh, so this is from Wojciech. Sorry if I sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, is it possible for bacteria to lose resistance to a certain antibiotic after a decreased exposure over a certain period of time? Yeah, sorry. Um, that's a, that's a that's a really good question. Um, that doesn't have a simple answer. The um, in some circumstances, yes. In other circumstances, no. Um, I, I tried to allude to this when I, when I talked about the colistin situation. Um, that's an example where things look pretty promising because it's very clear from other work that expressing colistin resistance is detrimental to E. coli in other ways. So when colistin selection is removed, those resistant organisms will quite quickly be outcompeted by other susceptible organisms in the in the in the same niche. Yeah. In um, in other cases, um, it's not so clear. So there's a um, high-profile study in the UK, um, or, or published led by a UK group, looking at efforts in multiple countries to stop using sulfonamide drugs. Um, and in that case, sulfonamide it was very successful in discontinuing sulfonamide use, but um, incidence of sulfonamide resistance remained high. Well, I think part of the issue can be that um, a single plasmid can confer resistance to multiple antibiotics. So it may be that um, stopping using one drug isn't enough if that plasmid is being selected for by other agents. Okay, interesting. Um, because yeah, logically you think after the um, they're not being exposed, that automatically the uh, bacteria that express less that express resistance will slowly die off, but. It's interesting to see that's not necessarily always the case. Yeah, it's, it's, it is very variable. So um, I think it depends on the fitness cost associated with the resistance mechanism. And some, some mechanisms are clearly, clearly detrimental. Others impose very little cost on the organism. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. So thank you for that. Uh, let's have a look at the next one. I could bring that up. Uh, uh, so, let's see. Are there collective global actions that can be taken against the threat of uh, antimicrobial resistance? So this one uh, was from Sarah. On what level can preventative measures be put into place? So, um, so that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so organizations like the, the WHO, um, they they are in, in, in engaging at an international level. Um, one of the recommendations from the O'Neill report was, was precisely that, having coordinated international action. Um, so I think that, ex that extends to making drugs available to people who need them. So I'm, for instance, I, I mentioned for TB that uh, poor compliance with treatment regimes or um, lack of access to drugs that means people don't finish taking the, 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 the course of antibiotics that goes on for months necessary to treat TB will select for resistant strains. So a cornerstone of the WHO's TB treatment strategy is making sure that access to drugs is there for people who need them for the entire duration of the, of the course. Um, I think um, having coordinated action to ensure that drugs and um, drug availability is appropriately regulated is important um, I think there are also issues around the um, availability perhaps of um, in many parts of the world of um, counterfeit antibiotics that um, maybe contain a reduced or minimal um, concentration of the active ingredient and then can also select for resistance um, but it is, yeah, it's really important that the country, countries work together. I think it's an area where in the past there's been an attribution of, of perhaps or an element of finger pointing about particular um, parts of the world where there's been 
observed to be high, high prevalence of resistance and or potentially, potentially um, less stringent regulation. I, it needs to be something that's, that's coordinated and cooperative. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I know definitely in some places when you go abroad, like it's so much easier to get, you can sometimes even get antibiotics without prescription and, you know, not having some sort of coordinated effort across the globe is, I think would be quite detrimental to that because, you know, bacteria, bacteria don't really know, understand borders and stuff like that. They just, they'll just probably. Oh, oh, for sure. And inter international travel is, is, is definitely a risk factor um, for resistance transmission. So, um, for, um, carbapenem resistance that I mentioned briefly, the, the initial spread of some of those resistance mechanisms has clearly been associated with um, come to, uh, strongly connected by cultural and other ties and whether there are high amounts of travel between those, those locales. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so next question, let's get that up. Uh, oh, this is a this is a good one. Yeah, this one I'm particularly interested in is uh, how can we find enough money to find uh, fund antimicrobial drug discovery? If we delink sales from success, then who will necessarily pay for it? Um, so I, I'm going to qualify this by saying that I'm absolutely not an economist. Um, Neil is an economist, and there are lots of ideas in his report about about doing this. Um, so there, there are there are a number a number of um, a number of things that have been proposed. So um, giving rewards for my, for, my, for hitting, hitting milestones along the antibiotic um, development pipeline is, is is one thing that's been proposed. Um, giving extended levels of patent protection is another. Mm. Uh, there is a debate over antibiotic pricing. Antibiotics are, are traditionally considered to be cheap medicines, whereas the, the, the price of uh, the course of a, a new cancer chemotherapy can often run into the, the, the tens or even hundreds of thousands of pounds of dollars. Um, and so anti um, there are certainly hard questions around antibiotic pricing. Um, ultimately, it is, it is something that the public purse will have to pay for to at least some degree. Um, but I think that needs to be offset against the cost of doing nothing. Um, the the impact in terms of um, working days, burden on the healthcare system of having large numbers of difficult to treat infections, um, prolonged hospital stays, um, a generally sicker population. Um, and it is also true that antibiotics can make profit if they are if they are used appropriately over a long time. So the combination of um, combinations of um, beta-lactams with the resistance inhibitor clobulinate um, were uh, a mainstay of uh, GSK for many years, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that potentially, like, I don't know how much this has been discussed, but that maybe like government could like sub subsidize pharma companies to a certain degree um, to help with the drug discovery process? Oh, that's yes. That's that. That's um, that has that is already happening on some scale. So, um, organisations like Carbex, um, which is a cooperation between the US um, and UK agencies, so supported early stage drug discovery in um, academic and um, SME settings as well. Um, the European Union, through initiatives like um, Enable, um, have been looking to fund antimicrobial research um, often incorporate as a cooperation between pharma companies and um, non-profits which in some circumstances have been a way of um, de-risking um, antibiotic discovery. Um, the the new TB agent that I referred to briefly, bedaquiline, um, that's maybe an exemplar for the kind of thing that might work. Um, so bedaquiline was originally um, identified in pharma but the Company, the, the friend, I can't remember which the company that initially came up with it. Um, they felt unable to take the financial to to bear the financial burden on their own of um, developing the developing it to, as a, an effective drug, and so it took a combination of of funders, um, mm. some governments, some NGOs, um, the Gates Foundation, I believe, that ultimately um, was able to take it successfully to to the clinic. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, do you think there's potentially any ways that the process can be uh, of discovering antibiotics can be streamlined to a certain degree? Like I know there's been a lot of discussion about maybe using more computational methods to try and uh, discover new potential leads and stuff like that, which would be less expensive than the traditional sort of methods where you just automatically start screening hundreds and thousands of compounds in one go. Um, yes, um, I think it depends. It depends to some extent what the end point is. Um, I think a lot of the, but in the past certainly, compounds have failed because the end point has been seen as an agent that is effective against multiple pathogens. If you couple, if you couple a new antibiotic with a reliable diagnostic, which means that you can be you can be prescribing something with some knowledge of what the target organism is, it makes narrow spectrum therapeutics targeting a particular, a single particular pathogen much more tractable and that would certainly reduce the development time. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that would, yeah, that would, that would actually sound like a good way. If you can have a, an easy way to get a very precise diagnosis, then trying to find, you know, you don't necessarily need such broad spectrum antibiotics. I never thought of it that way. Um, but yeah, I think we've got time for um, just one more question, unfortunately, um, which is from Suman. And they asked, is there a time when we won't have any antibiotics which can treat uh, bacterial infections? That's not the lightest note to end on, but <laughs> let's see. Um. It's a it's a good it's a good question. Um, actually, I, I, it's an impossible one to answer. Um, I'm with the without crystal ball. I am optimistic, um, hmm. cautiously optimistic. We have already come close. Um, I mentioned briefly that the um, glycopeptides, like, like vancomycin, which are key drugs for treating MRSA. So, so when van when vancomycin resistance was first identified. Um, in Enterococci, there was a lot of talk about um, the transfer to Staphylococcus aureus so the, to make an MRSA strain that would be vancomycin resistant. And I, I, I saw newspaper articles at the time talking about vancomycin resistant Staph aureus as the doomsday bug. Um, those strains were discovered, but they are still extremely rare for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. Um, similarly, there have been occasional reports of strains of organisms like E. coli that are resistant to carbapenems and colistin, um, as well as other drugs and are effectively untreatable. Um, in the TB area, um, there's um, there have been a few sporadic reports of what have been termed totally drug-resistant TB. Um, that's not a term that's, to my knowledge, is easily accepted, and I'm not aware that that resistance extends to bedaquiline. Um, so, in answer to Simon's question, um, we've come perilously close in a couple of instances, um, but I think at the, I, at the moment we seem to be still getting things just in time. So, um, antibiotic resistant staph aureus didn't take off, but in the in the meantime, um, we have we a couple of new treatments for staph aureus infection were brought to market such that um, the clinicians did have additional options. Um, yeah, I wouldn't like to say what would happen in 10 or 20 years time. Um, I think we not, we, we've not. we still got a bit to go, thankfully. Yeah, um, like you said, cautiously optimistic, I think is the best outlook to have with, with this stuff. Um, so sadly, that's, every, that's all we have time for today. Jim, thank you so much for an awesome talk. I really enjoyed it and I'm sure our audience did as well. Thanks to everyone who joined us today and please join us next week for our talk with Professor Anu Ojha, the director of the National Space Academy, who will be talking about critical thinking skills in a post-truth world. Have a great evening, everyone, and stay safe. Bye. Thanks very much, Anka. Bye. Thank you, Jim.